Thank, thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Before we begin today, I will please ask you to join myself, the Secretary General, Mr. Benjamin, and the distinguished airline, airport, and air navigation service provider officials present with us in IQ today in observing a brief moment of silence for the passengers and flight crews who have lost their lives in the accidents involving Malaysian Airlines, TransAsia Airways, and Air Algeria last week. So let's observe a brief moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. All of our thoughts and prayers go out to the friends and families of the victims of this very unfortunate event. While these three accidents will be comprehensively responded to once their accident investigations deliver official findings and recommendations, as per our IQ and extraction requirements, we should be clear from the outset that IQ and the heads of IATA ACI and Council have met here today to specifically discuss matters related to the loss of Malaysia Airlines Flight MH17. Our organizations, of course, are always in very close contact, and we work with both determination and cooperation on all global aviation matters. We have accordingly agreed this morning to take several near-term actions on a unified sectoral basis to review and mitigate to the fullest extent permissible and possible the risk to civil aviation arising from conflict zones. I wish to reiterate that IQ specifically continues to coordinate with the United Nations Security Council where the situation in Ukraine is concerned and that any actions we take will be consistent with the scope and intent of the Security Council Resolution 2166. Our joint statement has been distributed to all of you. I hope it has been. It will be distributed then to all of you. It demonstrates our commitment to work together in full coordination with IQ member states and the industry stakeholders. I will leave any further clarifications of IQ's next steps for the question and answer session that will follow. And we now request uh, Raymond Benjamin, the Secretary General, to present the joint statement. Raymond. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As has been mentioned by the President of the Council, the joint statement that I'm going to read uh, will be available to you in a few minutes. Bear with me, uh, English is not my mother tongue. The International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, the International Air Transport Association, IATA, Airports Council International, ACI, and the Civil Air Navigation Services Organization Council jointly express their strong condemnation of the use of weapons against civil aviation. The downing of Malaysian Airlines flight MH17 is unacceptable. Our organizations wish to convey our deepest condolences to the families of the passengers and crew who lost their lives in this tragic event. While aviation is the safest mode form of transport, the MH17 incident has raised troubling concerns with respect to civilian aircraft operating to from and over conflict zones. We have met at ICAO today with collective resolve to urgently review the issues and potential responses to be pursued. As a first step, states have been reminded by ICAO of their responsibilities to address any potential risks to civil aviation in their airspace. We recognize the essential need for information and intelligence that might affect the safety of our passengers and crew. This is a highly complex and politically sensitive area of international coordination. 
involving not only civil aviation regulations and procedures, but also state national security and intelligence gathering activities. All parties to the discussion agreed that ICAO now has an important role to play in working as urgently as possible with its member states in coordination with the aviation industry and other bodies within the United Nations to ensure the right information reaches the right people at the right time. Moving forward, ICAO will support, with support of its industry partners will immediately establish a senior level task force composed of state and industry experts to address the civil aviation and national security aspects of this challenge, in particular, how information can be effectively collected and disseminated. Submit the task force findings as urgently as possible to a special meeting of the ICAO Council for Action. Industry has called for ICAO to also address fail-safe channels for essential threat information to be made available to civil aviation authorities and industry, but also the need to incorporate into international law through appropriate UN frameworks measures to govern the design, manufacture and deployment of modern anti-aircraft weapons. Finally, ICAO is convening a high-level safety conference with all of its 191 member states in February 2015. Industry and governments stand united and committed to ensuring the safety and security of the global air transport system and its users. As I have mentioned, this statement will be available to you now in your press kits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benjamin. We'll now ask uh, members of industry to make some statements, uh, beginning with Mr. Tony Tyler of IATA. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Today, we had an extraordinary meeting of the leaders of the air transport industry. And we've come together in the aftermath of the tragedy of MH17 to find ways to make the air transport system safer and more secure. And the tragic shooting down of MH17 was an attack on the whole air transport industry. And the world's airlines are angry. And I suspect the same is true for each of the 3.3 billion people who will board aircraft this year. And I am appalled that even today, so long after that tragedy, to see media coverage of the, from, the, from the crash site where recovery of the bodies and a proper investigation of the, of the uh, event is still being hampered by uh, the activities of the people in control of that area. It's an appalling situation. But civil, air, civil aircraft are instruments of peace. They should never be the target of weapons of war. And that's enshrined in international law through the Chicago Convention and other treaties. Now, you've heard what is in our joint declaration. IATA, on behalf of its 240 member airlines, fully supports the important work that we've committed to. And we appreciate the urgency with which ICAO has called this meeting and will be setting up a task force. I believe we've made a great start. But of course, the goal is to move from the framework that's been agreed today and to deliver results. And I'd like to spend a few minutes to discuss the results the airline community is seeking. There's no escaping that what happened to MH17 was a tragedy that should not have happened. And it exposed a gap in the system. The system is not broken. It works extremely well in the vast majority of cases. And the proof of that is clearly evident in that air transport is the safest mode of global mass transit known to humankind. So the challenge is to close the specific gap or gaps that allowed this tragedy to happen. And from the airline perspective, there are two expectations I'd like to highlight. Airlines need clear and accurate information on which to base operational decisions on where and when it is safe to fly. In the case of MH17, airlines were told that flights above 32,000 feet that traverse Ukraine would not be in harm's way. And we now know how wrong that guidance was. It's essential 
that airlines receive clear guidance regarding threats to their passengers, crew and aircraft. And such information must be accessible in an authoritative, accurate, consistent and unequivocal way. This is the responsibility of states. There can be no excuses. Even sensitive information can be sanitized in a way that ensures airlines get essential and actionable information without compromising methods or sources. And although I'll repeat this is a state responsibility, I can also commit that the industry is ready to assist in any way possible to help governments to make this happen. The fir this first expectation and gap to close, I hope can be met in relatively short order. It's a top priority for all of us here today. There's a second gap that must also be filled, but which will take a longer time. There is no international law or convention that imposes on states a duty to manage the design, manufacture and deployment of anti-aircraft weapons. We have conventions that address chemical, nuclear, biological weapons, plastic explosives and the weapons trade generally. But MH17 has demonstrated that powerful and sophisticated anti-aircraft weaponry is in the hands of non-state entities. And under IKEA's leadership, I'm confident that we can find ways within the United Nations system to augment the international law framework to ensure that states fully understand and discharge their responsibilities in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. We'll now pass the floor to Angela Gittens of Airports Council International. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is a clear indication of the industry's unity and resolve when it comes to ensuring the safety of the traveling public. It's important to note that despite the Malaysia 17 tragedy, for which we extend our heartfelt sympathies to the families and friends of the affected, air travel remains the safest mode of transportation. This is just the beginning of a complex process, and although this matter is urgent, it is important that we take the time to fully examine the issue in order to avoid any unintended consequences. Any changes made with regard to policies on routings or the use of airspace will impact the operations of all stakeholders, and we urge the task force to give this careful consideration. What we can say with certainty is that for the overwhelming number of flights and passengers, the system has worked and it has worked well. What we need to address is the fact that some states may not have the capabilities or willingness to provide robust intelligent, intelligence in a consistent manner. This affects all stakeholders. Along every step of the traveler's journey, we need to make sure that we have actionable intelligence relating to threats. ACI is fully committed to working in collaboration with ICAO, IATA, and CANZO to ensure that we do everything in our power to minimize the risk that an event of this nature ever happens again. Thank you very much, Angela. Uh, we would now like to hear from Mr. Jeff Poole, the Director General of the Civil Air Navigation Services Organization. Uh, thank you and, and good afternoon. Uh, like my colleagues, uh, my first wish is to uh, express our sorrows and condolences to the families and friends of the MH17 tragedy. Today we have agreed and shown a collective will and sense of urgency to review and fix the shortfalls identified by the MH17 incident. And although the issues are primarily for states and ICAOs to address, I am very pleased that the task force to be established will involve Canzo and the other key industry stakeholders. We've also agreed today on the need to keep a sense of perspective. The, government's, the governance framework of civil aviation has actually served us well. Air traffic management as an integral part of aviation has a remarkable safety record. But MH17 reminds us all that we can always do better and need to do so. Now, in order to provide safe and effective air traffic management for airspace users and passengers, air navigation service providers need to uh, need correct and reliable information, guidance and decisions from states. In short, we need the right information at the right time uh, in the right place to enable prompt and appropriate airspace management actions. 
Now, some, there have been some concerns expressed about the disclosure and use of uh, intelligence information. But for air traffic management, we do not need to know the detailed uh, security and, and intelligence reasons behind risk assessments. What we do need are authoritative, accurate, and consistent information and decisions from the authorities. We are only as good as the information with which we are provided. Air navigation service providers are under very significant pressure to perform safely, operationally, and economically. To be blunt, it is now time for states to improve their own performance with regard to ensuring safety and security of airspace, and to do so globally beyond their own borders, whilst necessarily avoiding an over-defensive uh, reaction. Aviation is holistic, integrated and complex, so there can be no rigid boundaries or silos, even though roles and responsibilities need to be clear. I would like to uh, join my industry colleagues in thanking ECAO for leading this forum and initiative. Uh, CANSO and its members will participate actively in the uh, task force to be established and will work closely in partnership with ECAO, our industry partners and states. The review must necessarily be comprehensive and thorough, but must also take account of the risks of change and unintended con consequences. And we must also recognize that absolute perfection is uh, an illusory con concept, particularly when human beings are involved in uh, military, terrorist, or criminal actions or intents. I would like to conclude by saying that the families and friends of the victims of MH17, the traveling public, and the world at large must be able to see that the civil aviation community is addressing the issues raised by MH17 with unity, leadership, passion, commitment, urgency, common sense, and strong management. I believe that the joint statement uh, we have uh, published today provides the first real step of assurance that we know what to do, how to do it, and importantly, that we are getting on with it together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Poole. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be opening the floor now for a question and answer session. Um, because of the composition of our uh, head table today, questions may be addressed in English to any of the leaders of industry or to Dr. Aliu, President of the ICAO Council. And any questions appropriate to ICAO's role may also be addressed in French to Secretary General Benjamin. Um, if anyone wishing to ask a question, we're going to ask that you please line up behind the microphones on either side at the head of the uh, uh, aisles here, and we'll begin to answer your, uh, have your questions posed to the head table. We'll also be making a copy of the joint statement read by Mr. Benjamin available to all press who are here today um, at the back of the room as you're on your way out a little later on, as well as other statements and the state letter issued by ICAO last week. Thanks very much. Sylvain Larocque from La Presse. Thank you. Um, the European pilots were raising a good point. Uh, they were saying that uh, there seems to be maybe a conflict of interest because it's the states that decide if the uh, an airspace is, is valid for flying, where in some cases, like maybe in Ukraine, the state is involved in conflicts and maybe they're not the best the best place to decide if uh, an airspace is safe. So is there a way to change that, make, uh, make sure that it's not only a state that decides if an airsp uh, airspace is, is safe, that international organizations could get involved in the uh, that decision making? whoever wants to answer it. OK. Well, I, uh, thank you for that question. Um, certainly, within our rules, now is the responsibility of states to manage the risk within the airspace. But as has been said, there are some concerns. And that is why uh, we have had this meeting, and to see if there is and what role would be for IQ, uh, how to work better in consultation with our member states in risk assessment. Uh, these are all the issues 
that will be considered by this task force and advice will be provided uh, that will be considered by the ICAO Council. As you know, um, we have our role as a, an organization and the states have their role. And of course, we are not in competition with our member states, but we have to work together to ensure that the system meets the needs of the traveling public and of the industry. Uh, that is what we'll be working on. How, what role uh, ICAO can take to facilitate uh, the dissemination of information, of course, in full consultation with the member states and the industry. So, uh, right now is the responsibility of the states. And recently, uh, as you know, we have reminded the states of this responsibility in a state letter that was issued uh, to, and the state letter is the means by which we communicate with our member states uh, of their responsibility for risk assessment and to advise in the international uh, aviation community accordingly. But we will be looking for other systems, other methods by which this can be done. All right? Maybe I'd like to hear the industry members on this, please. Okay. Tony. As far as the industry is concerned, as, as, I, as I said, we've, we've called for um, a system that will disseminate information which will enable the right decisions to be made about whether airspace is safe or not. That's the critical um, requirement from, from the industry point of view. And as to how that is done, um, clearly is a matter for the, uh, the task force to consider and uh, and express their views on, and we will actively participate in that task force. All right. Allison, I'll ask you to answer, please identify yourself clearly and uh, uh, specify who you're directing your question towards, please. Thanks. Uh, Allison Martel from Reuters, over here. Um, President Aliou, um given that the intelligence agencies who you would need to do this, we're not in the room with you today. How confident are you that you can find consensus amongst all of your members on something as sensitive as sharing intelligence? I, I do agree with you. And that is part of the challenges that the civil aviation sector faces, uh, whether globally, but also at the national level. Um, there is need for civil military coordination in order to get anything done effectively. And um, Within our procedures, there is a requirement for that civil military coordination. Now, how this will be, is being carried out effectively and how to do a better job at that is some of the issues that the task force will look at. Maybe we need more guidance to our states, best practices to develop, for which they can be applied at the national level. Uh, we have to talk to the uh, civil uh, to the military authorities as well, and we expect that the member states that will be invited to participate in the task force, uh, there will be involvement of uh, people from the military uh, to take part in that. But you have pinpointed some of the challenges uh, that we have as civil authorities in this in this matter. Uh, Mr. Tyler, any thoughts on that? Yes, ultimately. All these agencies of government, including intelligence agencies or military defence agencies, have as their, as their surely their overriding prime responsibility the uh, the safety and the lives of innocent people. And um, whatever their national affiliations, surely it's in it, 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 they have a, they have a, a moral duty apart from anything else to ensure that innocent people um, are not put in harm's way, and they should they should take that into account when considering uh, whether or not they will will share information. Of course they should if they know something they know it's not safe. How can they sit back and watch um, innocent people um, threatened in this way? Thank you. Uh, just a quick procedural follow-up, perhaps best for Mr. Benjamin. Uh, do you anticipate that you would be ready to amend the Chicago Convention in February, or would that be happening much later? Um, I'm not considering, or, well, it's not up to me to, to amend the Chicago Convention, but in any way, I, I don't believe that this is the real issue, neither today or later on. 
Uh, I believe that the steps which have been identified are the ones which is to establish an immediate senior task force, industry, states, and then uh, to submit their findings to the Council, who represent the international aviation, civil aviation community, and then we will proceed from there to this worldwide conference that we will have. Uh, amending the Chicago Convention takes uh, a too long a time for an issue which is quite urgent. Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour, Monsieur Benjamin, Eric Charon de Cogeco Nouvelle. Si j'ai bien compris, les trois mesures avancées aujourd'hui, c'est la formation d'un groupe d'action, meilleure information des lignes aériennes et le renforcement des lois internationales pour les armes anti-aériennes. Euh, ça vous inquiète pas de devoir peut-être forcer la main à des groupes armés comme les insurgés pro-russes en ce qui concerne leurs armes? Est-ce que ça pourrait pas, selon vous, aboutir à un plus grand conflit encore euh, que les aéronefs euh, qui sont menacés par les armes? Ben, je pense que euh, aujourd'hui, euh, l'industrie et l'OACI, euh, nous avons pris nos responsabilités en définissant les étapes que nous allons prendre. Euh, nous ne pensons pas que nous allons rentrer en conflit avec euh, des groupes armés ou des groupes terroristes. Ce que nous essayons d'améliorer, c'est la façon dont les États disséminent l'information, la portent à notre connaissance et puis ensuite que nous la transmettions à l'industrie à de telle sorte qu'elle puisse assurer des conditions de transport optimales pour les passagers. Voilà. Merci. Merci de donner un exemple des lois internationales renforcées. Qu'est-ce que ça pourrait faire comme différence euh, pour la sécurité des avions civils? Comme l'a dit M. Tyler et également M. Poole et Mme Gittins, ce que nous voulons, c'est que quand une information existe, qui concerne la sécurité des vols, elle soit portée à la connaissance des intéressés, de telle sorte qu'ils puissent ne pas voler au-dessus des espaces qui sont contrôlés à l'heure actuelle par les séparatistes ou les autres dont vous avez parlé. Il s'agit simplement de dissimuler l'information quand elle existe. Donc, merci. Une information, une seule oui. Karen Walker, Air Transport, magazine, Air Transport World Magazine. Question for Tony Tyler. Um, Tony, can you get... Several of the uh, uh, of you today have mentioned un avoiding unintended consequences to what is already a very safe system in general. Can you talk a little bit about um, airline concerns on that perspective? And do the airlines, are they still seeking to have the final say on their route um, choices? Yes, I think, I mean, you know, Karen, you've heard me often enough um, say that we need to be careful about regulators need to be careful about how they how they draft regulation and how over an over regulated industry it will not be will not be a healthy industry it's not the right way to go and that regulations often have unintended consequences and yet you know you could say here i am now now calling for governments to um to to, to get their act together here and and, and uh, form ways of, of, of advising us in what is and what isn't safe. I think what um, we need to ensure, and, and, and Jeff Poole has, has referred to this in his opening remarks as well, is, is we need to ensure that we're, we're improving the current system. Um, we're not, well, the current system works, it's been proved to work. We don't need to um, throw away 100 years of good experience um, because of one terrible and, and tragic incident. Um, we've ident this that incident has identified a gap. Let's close that gap, but let's not completely rewrite the rules for how things are done in a way that will have unpredictable consequences. So yes, I believe at the end of the day, an airline should make the decision whether it will fly a particular route, but it needs to make that decision on the basis of, of complete, full, accurate, um, and, and clear information. And part of that information relates to the, the, the safety of, of the route. And it is very clearly government responsibility to declare whether a route is safe or not. So if you like, those are the, build, the building blocks are the same as ever. But we need to make sure that they, those building blocks are indeed um, fit for purpose. And um, MH17 identified at least one way in which they might not be, and we need to fix that. But we don't need to have wholesale changes to a system that's proven to work well for many years. So a follow-up uh, for Angela on that, uh, in that light, 
um, some people f felt that FAA um, overreacted on Ben Gurion Airport um, last week. What's your opinion? Was that the right call? Well, I really couldn't comment on that. I don't have the the information uh, on which the FAA based their decisions. I, I would I, I would indicate the, uh, the the whole thing kind of kind of illustrates the problem for the industry uh, in terms of consistency out of governments because different governments made different decisions uh, and that's something that's going to be a, a, a challenge for the task force to try to address. Thomas Dagler, CBC, I have a question about the, the task force and perhaps Dr. Aliou is best place to answer. Uh, who's going to be on the task force and what's their timeline? Okay. Uh, uh, the task force will cons comprise uh, senior industry experts. Um, of course, it will comprise experts from our member states, drawn from both the civil and, in some cases, the military as well. Uh, states will be invited to participate with such experts. It will also include the industry. Uh, including the three industries that are here present today, uh, and many other in industry stakeholders. Um, we expect the task force to be, we will establish the task force early next week, um, and the task force will work um, over perhaps the next, uh, I would suppose, six to eight weeks to submit this report. Um, but if you want to know specifically, there will be maybe Flight Safety Foundation will be invited, IFALPA will be invited, IFATCA will be invited, the manufacturers will be invited, uh, the Flight Safety Foundation, as I mentioned, uh, the victims, maybe representatives will be invited. Uh, so it will comprise a broad spectrum of industry stakeholders and the member states. And, and the, those recommendations in the report, are, are they going to be binding? What, what's going to happen then with those recommendations? Well, you have to understand the way IQ works, that whatever we have to implement, we have to get consensus and compromise uh, of our member states. And that starts first and foremost with the Council of IQ. So the report of the task force will be turned over to the IQ Council, and IQ Council will uh, consider the report for action. Uh, as has also been mentioned, We'll be convening in 2015, February 2015, a meeting of a high-level safety conference of all our 191 member states, where again, the industry stakeholders will be invited to participate. Uh, so if we want to get global consensus, that is the way forward to, 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 to do it. Thank you. Michelle Fleury from BBC, question for IKO. Uh, you've talked about uh, reminding Sort of the states involved with their duty to, to issue alerts about their airspace. What powers do you have to compel them if they fall short of their duty? <laughs> um, I guess it's an organization of states. We've agreed some responsibilities and obligations for the state. What we can always do is to remind them, guide the states, provide the guidance, uh, in implementing these requirements. Um, since we've issued the state letter reminding states, we've started receiving replies. Our state telling us, yes, we're taking note of what you said. We are taking action. We are doing the risk assessment. Um, so what power do we have to compel? Not much. But we depend on the free will of the states having entered into the convention, they are parties to the convention of IQ to implement those globally agreed uh, provisions. And a, a quick follow-up for Tony Tyler. Uh, we've heard, obviously, uh, the importance of communication. Is there any measures to improve communication amongst airline carriers? Um, airlines need to make their own assessments. Uh, of, uh, of where they're going to operate and how they're going to operate. Um, of course, airlines communicate with each other quite, quite, quite widely. Um, and th there are 
discussions going on between and within airlines and with ourselves about ways in which we can help to facilitate information flowing, it's very difficult because the last thing that airlines need is, is if you like, to have, um, you know, IATA or any other entity as a kind of institutionalized sort of rumor, rumor monger, if I could put it that way. Um, and that's why we, we must, at the end of the day, rely on governments to give us, as I've said, accurate, unequivocal, clear, um, and consistent information. Um, and um, in the absence of that, then we will we, we will be getting a lot of other communication passing between airlines and I mean, everybody with the best intentions of helping. But it's it, it's it's not helpful when you get con conflicting decisions or information, such as we saw only last week at Tel Aviv. Um, this kind of thing shows really that. Um, governments must do must do better. We can't we can't have situations like that recurring. If, 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 lady, um, sorry about that. If I may just add, um, that gap exists, and one of the things the task force will work on on how to for us to do a better job coordinating the gathering of the and dissemination of the information. Of course, ICA will have some role in that. Uh, but to facilitate the process, uh, but of course we will not be taking over the responsibilities of the states themselves. But we will work to, to have a mechanism by which we can coordinate that uh, globally. Clément okay. Sabourin de l'AFP. Monsieur Benjamin, est-ce que votre organisation est mobilisée en ce moment pour contrer les ou empêcher l'épidémie d'Ebola de se répandre en Afrique de l'Ouest Il y a une compagnie. Togolaise tout à l'heure qui a annoncé la suspension des vols vers le Libéria et le Sierra Leone. Je voulais savoir dans quelle mesure votre organisation avait un rôle à jouer face à une telle épidémie. Euh, que ce soit dans le cas de, de, de l'épidémie Ebola ou dans les risques de grippe aviaire que nous avons connus par le passé, l'OACI a un rôle à jouer et nous le jouons en coordination avec l'Organisation mondiale de la santé. Et nous le jouons avec différentes organisations des Nations Unies. Et les conséquences pour ce qui est du transport aérien sont prises très au sérieux à l'heure actuelle, comme vous venez de le souligner vous-même. Vous avez émis des avis, des recommandations Les avis en question sont émis à partir de notre coordination avec l'Organisation mondiale de la santé. Le dernier développement dont vous venez de faire part, à savoir l'interruption des vols d'une compagnie aérienne, va nous amener à réagir très rapidement maintenant. Merci. Thank you. I'd like to please ask that the questions remain focused on the MH17 incident that we're gathered here for today, please. Bonjour, Maud Montambeau, Radio-Canada. Ma question pour M. Benjamin. Votre collègue, M. Tyler, tout à l'heure, parlait d'un trou euh, dans le système et de deux attentes en particulier, comme vous le disiez tout à l'heure, lorsque l'information existe, la transmettre, mais également euh, de, de lois qui pourraient être imposées, euh, bref, qui seraient peut-être manquantes. Pouvez-vous m'en dire plus là-dessus? Oui, bien sûr. Ce, que, ce à quoi a fait référence M. Tony Tyler, c'est un instrument juridique international qui permettrait de contrer la menace et ses armes contre l'aviation civile. Je vous rappelle que, par exemple, il y a une vingtaine d'années, quand les explosifs plastiques ont été une menace pour l'aviation civile, nous avons élaboré une convention sur le marquage des explosifs plastiques. Nous avons une commission qui travaille là-dessus. Donc, nous pouvons prendre acte très rapidement. Néanmoins, en ce qui concerne la suggestion de M. Tyler, nous sommes bien conscients que dans le cadre des Nations Unies, il y a des organisations qui travaillent sur ce sens de sujet. Et ce que nous allons faire, c'est rentrer en contact avec eux pour voir dans quelle mesure est-ce qu'ils peuvent donner suite à la suggestion qui vient d'être faite par l'industrie. C'est-à-dire déclarer lorsque les pays possèdent des missiles, des choses comme ça ou... C'est-à-dire bâtir un instrument juridique qui permette, de le, le, c'est écrit dans le communiqué de presse, aussi bien la fabrication de ces armes que leur dissémination, Merci. de telle sorte que l'on puisse les contrôler. Puis que, que, comment vous allez l'appliquer, en fait? Comment est-ce que nous comment, allons... Quel, seront le, quel sera le processus pour en venir à ces lois-là? Le, le, le processus sera d'abord un coup de téléphone de mon président aux Nations Unies, 
pour dire à son contrepart ce que nous allons dire. Et, et puis ensuite, il y aura des experts juridiques, des experts antiterroristes, des experts de l'aviation qui doivent travailler sur ce sujet. Comme nous l'avons fait dans des cas précédents. Ce n'est pas quelque chose de nouveau que nous ne connaissons pas. Merci. Gerd Braun, a correspondent for newspapers in Germany. Um, you all mentioned the need from uh, to get information from the states and from the uh, intelligence uh, agencies uh, to assess the risk. On the other hand, in especially in Europe, we have a fierce and emotional debate about the rights of intelligence agencies and the fear of people of uh, intrusion into their privacy. How do you want to balance this? Is what you would say, is this a call for a free pass for intelligence agencies to collect information or how do you want to balance this? Look, um, have to be, uh, we have to be very frank with you. There are, there are challenges of political, social, political, economic, intelligence challenges um, associated with it. It is not as simple as it is seen because the ramifications of what the industry is asking for goes beyond the civil aviation sector. And there is need to find consensus, not only globally, but at the national level, And there is need for, to consider all these issues, including the legal issues that you have just uh, mentioned. Um, that cannot be done in a GV, and that's why we have this task force to sit down and consider all these issues uh, in order to find a way forward and propose a way forward that can be considered by the ICAO Council. Um, uh, that's all what I can tell you, that let's give the task force the opportunity to do the, that work. They will consider all the factors the issue of privacy, the issue of liability for the information that is being given, and uh, the issue of uh, uh, how to keep that information, and for that information to be used only for safety purposes, to assure the safety of flights only. Uh, so there are quite a number of issues that we have to go through uh, in order to build uh, the possible structure, that uh, mechanism that the industry has put the request uh, to us. But what we have said is that we are ready to look at it, and we want to do that proactively, um, and in 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 a, in a time uh, in a timely manner. And that is why we are going through this unconventional route. As you know, at the international level, we find it takes time to get consensus but on this unconventional route uh, to get a task force to work together and propose something to the ICAO Council, and then we'll take it forward uh, from there. Okay. Um, I, I don't have a lot to add to, to what the president has, has said. I mean, clearly, this is an area the task force will have to uh, have to, to look at. But the fact is, the intelligence agencies have have information, and uh, we believe that they have it. They have to share it where it can lead to the, the saving of uh, of human life. And um, and this doesn't get to the point about whether their rights to to um, gather information or how they how they do it is another matter completely. And, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's not a, that's not a concern here. That's a, that is a, a genuine concern, but it shouldn't be a concern here. What, what, what is a concern here is if they have information, then then they should share it where it will lead to the saving of, 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 of human life or the, the prevention of human life being put in jeopardy. Just to note, we're going to take five more questions, and then we'll be making the leaders available for uh, short one-on-one -on -one interviews after the press conference. Alexandre pouliot roberge agence euh, Racia Sivogne. Euh, ma question est pour M. Benjamin. Euh, vous avez déclaré euh, cet accident-là comme étant quelque chose d'inacceptable, mais le gouvernement ukrainien, par sa part, lui, parle d'acte de terrorisme. Est-ce que votre organisation considère cela aussi comme un acte de terrorisme ou vous, a, ou vous avez l'impression un peu que le gouvernement ukrainien essaie peut-être de se défiler un peu de ses responsabilités au niveau de la gestion de la région? Uh. Vous savez, monsieur, comme moi, qu'à l'heure actuelle, il y a une enquête en cours. Euh, comme l'a dit monsieur Tyler, d'ailleurs, cette enquête est à l'heure actuelle extrêmement difficile et contrariée. 
Euh, en l'absence de, des résultats de l'enquête, nous ne faisons aucune spéculation euh, en ce qui concerne cet incident. Nous avons dit qu'il était extrêmement regrettable parce qu'il y a eu des, des vies qui ont été perdues, mais nous nous qualifions l'accident en aucune façon ni de terroriste ni de pas terroriste. À l'heure actuelle, nous attendons le résultat de ces investigations. Vous savez également que l'OACI a dépêché des experts sur place euh, qui sont aussi bien en Ukraine que, à l'heure actuelle aux Pays-Bas poursuivre l'enquête en, en droit conformité avec l'annexe 13 de la Convention de Chicago. Voilà ce que je peux vous dire, monsieur, à ce stade. Marie-Laure Josselin, Radio-Canada. Toujours monsieur Benjamin. Euh, il, il, en temps normal, les gouvernements étaient déjà censés vous donner les informations euh, sur ce qu'ils avaient comme euh, sur les risques. Comment vous pouvez imaginer que cela va changer juste parce que vous allez faire une task force et que vous allez leur demander un peu plus, d'y mettre un peu plus du leur comme, comme euh, je l'ai rappelé dans ma lettre aux États, dont vous avez une copie, euh, ce que j'ai dit aux États, c'est voilà quelles sont vos responsabilités. Et leur responsabilité, c'est de faire une évaluation du risque et de prendre les mesures sur leur espace aérien en droit ligne avec leur évaluation du risque. À l'heure actuelle, il n'y a pas d'obligation pour ces États de me notifier de ce genre de décision. Ce que nous souhaiterions voir comme un rôle à venir, c'est justement qu'il y ait une meilleure dissémination de cette information et une transmission de cette information à l'industrie de telle sorte qu'elle puisse opérer de façon sûre. Et si elle ne, fait, ne le ferait pas, qu quelles seraient leurs conséquences qu seraient et, et bien à ce moment-là, euh, là aussi, l'équipe de travail, la task force, devra réfléchir à ce cas de figure. Okay. Deuxième question, ce n'est pas la première fois qu'il y ait des, un vol commercial qui est abattu. On en a eu plusieurs. Pourquoi celui-ci spécifiquement ça fait tout ce remue Est-ce que c'est parce qu'il y a eu la disparition Il y a eu Air Algérie aussi Non. Euh, il y a eu euh, ces dernières semaines plusieurs euh, pertes d'avions. Euh, les circonstances sont différentes dans chacun de ces cas. Le, le, le vol MH17 est un cas particulier dans lequel un avion civil a été abattu par un missile. Ceci, c'est la première fois un missile sol-air. Donc c'est en ça que ceci est exceptionnel. L'avion euh, d'Air Algérie, pour lequel à l'heure actuelle on est en train de lire les boîtes noires, obéit à d'autres circonstances que celle-là. Je pensais plus au, au vol en 83 ou en 88, euh, je pensais euh, aux états unis qui avaient tiré un, un vol de Air, euh, Air Iran, si je ne me Là aussi, les cas précédents étaient différents. Mais est-ce qu'il y avait eu des rencontres comme ça Est-ce qu'on avait essayé de... Oui, il y avait eu des rencontres, le Conseil s'était réuni. Uh, Levon Simons, uh, DPH, uh, German News Agency. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Tyler and Mr. Poole. Uh, I understand, if I understand correctly, there is um, a fee that uh, countries receive if they have an air corridor passing through their airspace. Um, can you speak about a bit about a conflict of interest that arises, especially in a case like uh, Ukraine, where uh, apparently uh, the country is already struggling financially, How how would you resolve a conflict of interest like that when uh, the country would certainly want to keep uh, a revenue stream coming, but uh, would face uh, losing a lot of money if it advises uh, uh, you know airlines not to go through its airspace? I'm sure that uh, no no country, no civilized person will put um, a few dollars ahead of the value of, of human lives. Um, and, and certainly in an, in an industry which, as this one does, takes safety as the first priority, um, you know, that, that, that is a, a trade-off that, that really doesn't have to be made. There's only one answer to that. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I need to agree totally with uh, Tony Tyler there. Uh, uh, safety of the passengers and of the aircraft is the absolute priority of the air navigation service providers. So I, I understand the theory of your question. In practice, it, it, it should not arise. I, you said earlier that the industry is very angry. Is there some anger to, uh, directed towards Ukrainian authorities for not uh, um, diverting the, uh, the planes earlier? Look, I mean, 
the reason that this tragedy happened was that somebody shot this aircraft down with a, with a, with a missile. Um, and that's what makes us angry. It makes us more angry that, that even today, as I said, some what is, is it more than 12 days later, um, people are still making it difficult to recover the, the, the bodies of the deceased and to investigate the accident or the, the incident properly. Um, those are the sorts of things that make us angry. Thank you. Hannah Thomas Peter from Sky News. This is a question for Mr. Tyler. Uh, given the systemic and substantial flaws that you've identified today, flaws that have not yet been fixed, air passengers all over the world may well be alarmed. What assurances can you give them that they are safe when they fly? Well, as I said, the system is not is not um, is not broken. The MH17 um, incident has has demonstrated that there may be gaps in the system that need to be closed. But let's keep it in perspective. This is as as, as uh, Mr. Benjamin just said. This is this is an exceptional case. It's the first time that this that a, that a peaceful civil air aircraft has been shot down by a missile from the ground like this. And we need to keep that in perspective. Um, these, these, this kind of incident is, fortunately, extremely rare. And uh, um, I believe that passengers traveling today can, can, can rest in the confidence that this is not something that, is, that, is, that has anything above a tiny, tiny probability of, of, of happening. I accept that, but you identified flaws, systemic flaws, as a result of... No, I have not identified systemic the, the point that I precisely have not identified systemic flaws is that the system works. They're clearly, this incident has identified a gap in the system which needs to be, um, needs to be addressed, but it's a gap that has been identified once in, in 100 years of very safe civil aviation. So that is precisely what we have not done, is identify systemic flaws, and, and I, I therefore you know, have to correct that expression. I'm with the Canadian press. Um, I think, Mr. Tyler, you mentioned earlier that uh, it's up to governments to basically let you know whether, whether something is safe to fly over. Now, in the case of the MH17, they were over a disputed area. You've got two, two parties, two countries basically fighting over that. I don't want to bring up the Middle East, but it's also the same issue where you've got two different countries. Now, who takes responsibility? In the case of, for example, in the MH17, Ukraine, Russia, uh, the, the uh, rebels, uh, who's the country that has to take the ultimate responsibility there? Under... under well-established international law, the Chicago Convention. The country that has the, the country above whose airspace um, we, we, we're talking about has sovereignty over that airspace, and it has to be the government of that country that takes responsibility. And if it cannot, if that country cannot declare its airspace to be safe, then it should say so, and airlines will know that the airspace is closed and they won't fly over it. Ultimately, it is the country that has sovereignty of the airspace that has to take responsibility. Uh, let me just say this also. There are no systemic issues with respect to civil aviation. The system has worked and is working. The fact that we are having this discussion should not be construed, should not actually add to alarming the passengers, is to reassure them. Because like any, like no other industry, what, I, what a civil aviation does is to respond to extraneous issues. None of this is the result of action by civil aviation. None. We are trying to adapt and react to the changing operating environment arising for external factors. It is a pity that uh, this industry somehow is attractive for nefarious activities sometimes because of the high profile nature, whether starting from the issue of hijacking or the use of 
civilization as a weapon of mass destruction, but all these are extraneous factors to our industry. And what we're doing is to respond. And that should reassure the traveling public. And that is what we've been doing as an, as an industry since this industry was established and since ICO was established 70 years ago. And we'll continue to do that. So the message that I want to go out there is that we're taking note of any of these factors and we're taking immediate action to see where we can address them. But they do not arise as a problem from civil aviation. They are all extraneous, the issue we're considering. Okay. Thank you very much, President Elliot. Ladies and gentlemen, that'll conclude the question and answer session of the press conference now. Um, the leaders will be making themselves available. Uh, President Daliu and Mr. Benjamin will remain on the stage uh, for reporters wishing to come up and conduct a brief interview sessions, three to four questions. And um, the other leaders from the respective industry organizations will be uh, established in other parts of the room. Please, uh, please seek us out and find us to get in line and get, uh, get your chance to address them as you wish. Thank you. Thank you.